But uh, Hebrews chapter 12, you can remain seated as we look at uh, verse 11. Notice the Bible says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be, what's that word? Joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them <coughs> which are exercised thereby. Let's pray together. Father, we pray tonight that you'd please teach us some things about the Christian life, about this school of Christ that all of us are in that know you as Savior, that we might be molded and shaped into the image of your Son. Lord, help us to never get discouraged or bitter at the chastening and adversity that comes into our lives, but may we respond to it in a way that's pleasing to Thee. And I pray You'd use the message tonight just to challenge us and to encourage us. I pray for a fresh filling of Thy Spirit tonight. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here this evening that's not truly been born again, has not been regenerated, that tonight would be the night of salvation for them. And for the believer, Lord, again, you'd work in our hearts this evening that we might gain understanding from this passage tonight. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, here in Hebrews chapter 12, what we're finding and what we've been finding throughout this series is that the Lord is giving us some vital instructions on how every believer, every one of us, may I emphasize that one more time, every believer can not only start the Christian life well, but also finish the Christian life well. You know, a lot of people start well, but fewer finish well. Uh, I, I'm like you. I want to start well, and I want to finish well uh, also. Now, when I say believer, I'm speaking of those who have been born again. Uh, those that have been truly regenerated, have been saved, that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now, finishing well, we know, can be a challenge uh, because the Christian life that we are called to live, and may I say, if we choose to live it, because we need to choose to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, but this uh, life we've been called uh, to live is not easy. Now, salvation's simple. It's free. It costs God His Son, but it's, we receive it freely. Uh, but again, discipleship is not. Uh, it's definitely very costly, and sad thing is that very few Christians are willing uh, to pay the price. Uh, but again, uh, it's not going to be easy if we choose to be a disciple. We, our lives will be filled with trials and tribulations and difficulties. Uh, we'll face unexpected uh, trouble, unplanned events, unplanned obstacles along the way. Uh, that's what it is. Now, after the Lord gave us in chapter 11 a list, if you will, of believers that finished well, that obtained a good report, uh, God goes on in chapter 12 now to give you and me instructions on the Christian life so that you and I can do the same. Would you raise your hand if you want to finish well? Now, be honest, if you don't, don't just put it up because somebody's looking at you or because you know that's the thing I'm supposed to do. I want to finish well too. I want to obtain a good report. I want to graduate the school of Christ with honors, if you will. Now, when chapter 12, again, that's what this is all about. Now, chapter 12 began with several key phrases, and we pointed them out. That's kind of been this <coughs> series, if you will, going through each of those phrases. The first one we saw in verse 1 spoke of running this race with patience. And we mentioned that this race we're in is not a marathon. Don't miss it. It's not a, you know, we're not morning glory Christians, if you will. It's not a sprint, again. It is a marathon, not a sprint. It's long distance, amen? And that's what it means there when it says run this race uh, with uh, patience. Then he tells us in verse 2 to look unto Jesus. There's another good uh, admonition, if you will. Uh, keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, not on other people. Amen. So many Christians have fallen because they're looking around at what everybody, everybody else either is or isn't doing. And they get discouraged because of that. Looking unto Jesus is what he tells us to do. Then in verse 3, we are to consider Him, meaning not just to know facts about the Lord, uh, but to uh, uh, model His life, use His life as a model for ours. 
Then in verse 3, he also said to endure, that we will endure a contradiction of sinners. In other words, as we're running this marathon, we are going to face opposition from people. Yes, we will, from foes and family and friends and even the faithful at times. And then in verse 4, he tells us how we're striving against sin. In other words, the enemy that we fight is our own sin nature and our sin. We like to think it's other people. It's really not. The biggest problem in the Christian I have, in the Christian life I have, is myself. That person I look at in the mirror uh, every morning. And then in verses 5 through 11, God gives us a rather lengthy portion of Scripture now on a truth that he says, notice in verse 5, that is often forgotten. He says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you, as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. This truth he says in these verses, from verses 5, really all the way down to verse 15, is that God uses something in our lives called chastening or adversity, or we could say broadly uh, difficult situations, trying circumstances to do what? To build his children. You want to be a stronger Christian? Yes, so do I. Guess what? Chastening is going to happen. Adversity is going to happen. That's God's means of building us. Now last week, I won't go through every verse again, but last week we looked in verse 10, and we saw from verse 10 three reasons that God brings or allows adversity in our lives when we saw for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Reason one, we experience adversity so that through our adversity others are benefited. I like the Lord Jesus Christ. He went to the cross of Calvary so that others would be benefited. Our adversity uh, will cause others to benefit as well, and that pleases the Lord. We also saw the second reason we experience adversity is for our profit. Is there something in your life, a, a character trait, that needs improving on? Well, God will bring adversity. He'll bring that to light. He'll bring chastening to build our Christian character. And then the third reason we saw in verse 10, we experience adversity uh, properly responded to is going to cause us to take on, be partakers of the very nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings us here to verse 11. Now here in verse 11, and you know where I'm going because you got the handout tonight, we read an interesting thing which I believe is a very, very important truth. <laughs> Notice we find, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Uh, although chastening and adversity may not seem to be joyous, you know that the Bible teaches it's supposed to be joyous. Amen? Oh, Amen. It is supposed to be joyous. Now you're looking at me like I have three heads. Well, maybe by the end of the message you'll only look at me like I have two. Uh, but hopefully we'll clear a little bit of, it, of this up. Tonight I want to preach on the subject, notice, experiencing joy while enduring chastening. Now you might want to write somewhere uh, in a blank, uh, there's no blank there, but maybe next to the text, uh, the definition of joy. That's very important to understand. Now remember, joy is not, I'm going to put it real simple tonight, joy is not emotional happiness. That's feelings. Oh, I feel good today. I'm in a good mood. Things are wonderful. That's emotional happiness. That's not what joy is. Uh, joy is not emotional happiness. Joy is defined simply as a calm delight in the soul. Now, that's a good thing. A calm delight in the soul. And the Bible teaches that we are to experience this calm delight in the soul while we are in the midst of enduring chastening. This is a Bible truth that in our flesh, in my flesh, seems impossible to do. Think, how can I experience joy, a calm delight when I'm going through the ringer, when I'm going through difficulties? 
when I'm facing trials and tribulations. Well, let me just say this. We know that it's not impossible to do this for several reasons. First of all, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We can do all things, by the way, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, God never commands us to do something that he does not enable us to do. And so we find this truth in the Bible of uh, experiencing joy while enduring chastening in the form of both, number one, write this down, commands, and also by example. So first we see this Bible truth is commanded to us, for, uh, to us to do. God commands us, it's a command, to have joy in adversity. Now turn the two pages or so over to your right, since we're there. I wasn't going to turn there, but we will anyway, to James chapter 1 and verse 2. Notice what we find. Familiar verse, but notice what the Bible says. My brethren, save people, there it is, James 1, 2. Count it all what? Joy, there it is again, when ye fall into diverse temptations. That word temptations has the idea of trials, adversity, things that God brings in our lives to teach us. Uh, so we're commanded here to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, here it is, but we glory in tribulations also. What's interesting is I looked up that word glory, and that word glory means to rejoice in. There it is again. God is saying in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3 that we are to glory in or to rejoice in tribulation also. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5? He said in verse 11 and 12, Blessed are ye, uh, when ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He went on in verse 12 to say, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. There it is again. When we face uh, men reviling us and persecuting us, Jesus Christ said, Rejoice and be glad about it. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Just trying to make the point here. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Always means all the time. Good times, bad times, mountaintops, valleys. When we're in the thick of it, in the midst of stuff, we are still to rejoice in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16 says rejoice evermore. He's not saying here, hey, you know, when you get to heaven, you're going to really rejoice and I know we will that's a Bible truth as well but he's telling us here rejoice now rejoice here rejoice evermore again a joy is not emotional happiness it is a calm delight in the soul so the Bible clearly commands the believer to rejoice in adversity but you know, we also see examples of this as well. So we see this truth uh, by command, and then we see it also by example. Go back a page, back to Hebrews chapter 12. The first and finest example of this truth is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he is always the first and finest example. When he went to the cross of Calvary, we're told in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, the Bible says, for the joy, there it is again, that was set before him, he endured the cross. You may be thinking, well, that was Jesus Christ. That's not me. 
Uh, I'm different. I'm not God in the flesh. I'm not 100% God and 100% man. Okay, then let's turn to Acts chapter 16 and let's see a person that's uh, not the same as the Lord Jesus Christ, but has the same uh, flesh that you and I have as well. Acts chapter 16, I think you know the passage. Here is Paul and Silas. You know the deal. They went into Philippi. Uh, they preached the gospel there. <coughs> they led Lydia to the Lord. Uh, Lydia gets saved. Of course, uh, they get themselves in some hot water. And we read how they're beaten and thrown in jail in Philippi. And notice they could have been down. They could have been discouraged. They could have been complaining. They could have said, man, things were going so well. People getting saved. A church started. And now we're in prison. What in the world's uh, going on? But you know what happened. Look at verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, I'm sure that felt good, uh, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, notice thrust them into the inner prison. Uh, that's the most secure place, by the way, and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas murmured and complained unto God. And the, oh, wait a minute. That must be the NIV. Uh, no, it, uh, let me go back. Uh, to, uh, let me go back. And at midnight, Paul, let me put my, no, I'm sorry. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And so notice, here they are in the midst of a trial, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of a situation that wasn't pleasant at all, and they're praying and singing praises to God. So it is possible for me and for you to experience joy even while we're bearing the burden and enduring, carrying along some sort of trial or adversity in our lives. But I want to ask you tonight, does that describe you? Oh, many of us, including this preacher many times, you can tell what kind of day I had by the face I bring into church. Uh, by our attitude and by the way we are. Uh, and again, now we're not talking about singing and frolicking around every moment, but there's a deep-seated joy that should be present if we are facing the adversity and seeing it the right way. And so I know the question you're going to ask. All right, preacher, how do we do that? If we can do that, I want to know how to do it. Well, let's find out tonight. You see, the only way that we can rejoice in adversity is if we have these following three things that I've given you tonight that we find in the text. Number one, the first thing is if we're going to have in, uh, joy while enduring adversity, we need to see with eyes of faith. See with eyes of faith. Now, notice Hebrews chapter 12. Go back there because I'm in Acts chapter 16 myself. And uh, let me find Hebrews 12 here. Uh, notice our verse. The Bible says, Now no chastening for the present. Notice the word seemeth to be joyous. Now understand the point here is not that chastening cannot be joyous. The point here is that if we are not looking at it right, then it will not seem to be joyous. You see, we must look at our adversity with eyes of faith. You know, Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 tells us that the just shall live by what? Faith. What is the opposite of the faith life? The sight life. In other words, we respond to things as we see them, not as they are in the Word of God. God wants us to live the faith life. You see, if we only look at what is right in front of us, the things that we see, the things that only the human eye can see, then we will absolutely miss the opportunity for joy. May I remind us tonight that things are not always as they seem. They're not always as they appear. We may even go as far as to say that things are never as they seem. Never. But uh, what we can see is not everything that's occurring. And that's the problem. 
We operate by sight. You see, what faith does is faith enables us to see that God is at work behind the scenes in every circumstance. Do you believe that tonight? If you do, you'll have joy. If you don't, you won't have joy. If you're walking around with your lip hanging down to your knees tonight, uh, then something's wrong. You're not experiencing the joy that God wants you to experience. And perhaps it's because you're not seeing that whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is you're dealing with, you're not seeing that God is indeed at work behind the scenes. You say, well, I don't see it. That's the problem. You're looking for something to see. We don't need to see it. We just need to believe what the Bible says. Now, there's a great, this great truth is illustrated way back in 2 Kings. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 6. If you remember 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha the prophet was being pursued by the king of Syria. The king of Syria couldn't figure out because everywhere he was going, Elisha was to, to go after Israel. Elisha was telling the king of Israel where they were going. And now the king of Syria thought, somebody's a spy around here. What's the deal? And one of his men said, nobody's a spy, king. Elisha's a prophet. And, and he's seeing some things. And God's telling him where he are. And he's telling the, the king of Israel. And so he said, where is Elisha? And he was in Dothan. And so he said, let's go after him. By the way, they weren't going after him to shake his hand or pat him on the back. They were going after him to kill him. And we read in verse 15 of 2 Kings uh, chapter 6. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, here they are, uh, uh, Elisha and his servant, and they're, they're in a building that he rises up early, his servant, and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So imagine here it is, the servant's getting up in the morning, and things had been well and quiet. All of a sudden, he looks out the window, and he sees the sun rising over here, and he glances to the side, and he sees this huge army of the Syrians coming his way and surrounding them. He gets nervous. He panics. And so he goes to Elisha. I don't know if Elisha was awake or not, but he says, Elisha, look what's going on. What are we going to do? And look at verse 16. And he, Elisha, answered, notice this, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now imagine what that servant thought. Wait a minute. I can do math. One, two. And I can see a whole bunch of people out there. Uh, I think he got it wrong. He didn't have it wrong. You see, Elisha was operating by faith. He knew he was a child of God. He knew God was protecting him. And so notice what Elisha did. He says, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Verse 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, notice this, open his eyes that he may see. And we know what happened there. We read, and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Maybe you're here tonight, and you're going through it, and boy, I'll tell you, you don't have the joy of the Lord. Can I say to you tonight what Elisha said to his servant? Lord, open their eyes so they may see. See beyond the surface. See beyond what you're seeing with your own eyes, what the human eye can see. And understand in every situation in your life and in my life, God is at work. He's working. He's doing things. And we have to believe that by faith. Moses believed that as well. We read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 27, we read, By faith he forsook Egypt, Moses did, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as, see, as seeing him who is invisible. Why did he leave Egypt? Why did he forsake the riches? I mean, he would have had a wonderful future there, a worldly, in the world's mind, uh, if he just stayed there. No, no, no. He wasn't living by sight. He was living by faith. Uh, and he knew there was a God in heaven that he uh, wanted to serve, and he saw him who is invisible. How did he see him? By faith. You see, faith not only lets us see that God is at work, but faith makes it possible for us to experience joy in our adversity. You know, sometimes you just got to say this. I don't know why this is happening, but, you know, I know God's doing something. I know he's working. 
I know he is, and I, I believe that by faith. And although this is difficult, I know there's no, uh, we examine if there's sin in our lives and so forth, but if there's not, we just have to commit it to God and bear it and endure it and let God work through that adverse situation. Now notice, write these down, I'm going to shoot them out real quick. There are several things that work against faith. First of all, number one is our logic. Our logic. Human reasoning, our logic always works against faith. And number two, uh, and that is this, our eyesight. What we see works against faith as well. Again, it's not just about what we see. God is at work uh, behind uh, the scenes, if you will, or behind what we can see. And then there's a third thing that works against our faith, and that is the world and its philosophies. You see, the world tells us that things uh, are a certain way, <coughs> and so forth. And that's going to work against our faith. And understand, if we listen to logic, if we listen to sight, if we listen to the world, we are going to miss out on what God has uh, for us. Do you know, I, I've come to learn something, and that is this. The most miserable Christian that, Christians that I know are those who live the sight life. They live the sight life. They think and believe that things are as they seem to be. And they allow their circumstances and the circumstances of their suffering to make them absolutely miserable. And usually they try to make as many around them as miserable as they are as well. That's the way it works. You see, understand something. Even when things are going what we would say wrong, or we're going through a difficulty, or we're going through a trial, understand God is not dead. God is alive and well, and God is working. And so if you're going to experience joy in your circumstances, and if I am as well in my adversity, then faith is absolutely required. Again, it enables us to see that God is at work behind the scenes in every situation and circumstance. So the first thing you need is to see with eyes of faith. Let me ask you tonight, are you? You know, I can preach that, I can nod at that, and I can amen that. But to live that is a totally different thing. Because I'm a human being with feelings and emotions as well. And i got to constantly turn to the Bible and almost play a little war in my mind. How many know what I'm talking about? When the flesh wants to go this way, I go, wait a minute here. God's on the throne. Wait a minute here. God's doing something. Wait a minute here. Uh, God's working in this situation. And so again, we must see with eyes of faith. There's a second thing we need found in uh, going back to Hebrews chapter 12. And not only must we see with eyes of faith if we're going to have joy in the endurance of trials, but secondly, we need to foresee the future. Yeah, I'm not talking about a word of knowledge. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that at all. Notice, if you will, Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about afterward. Notice we read, Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous, or grievous. Notice, nevertheless, I like this word, afterward. Do you know whatever you're going through, afterwards is coming. You're not going to be in this thing forever. You absolutely are not. But understand, in order to have joy uh, during the adversity, we must remember the temporary nature of our trials. Now, my flesh fights that. Fights that. I get down, oh, how long is this thing going to go on? Forever! You know? No, it's not. It's going to be over. You will not be in that circumstance forever. You say, well, it might take me till I die. Maybe so, but then you're free from it after that. Amen. And it's not going to be forever. You know the phrase, and it came to pass, and this is on your sheet here on the back side of it. The phrase, and it came to pass, is found 396 times in the Bible. You know why? Because things come to pass. You may not think it's going to right now. You may feel like uh, it's never going to end, but it is going to come to pass. Again, no matter how tough the Christian life gets, 
Even if we go from one thing to the next, uh, to the next, and that's what's going to happen, by the way, never forget that graduation day is coming, amen? It's coming. One day we're going to graduate and be with the Lord. And understand, God brings adversity into our lives for a future purpose. That's important. Now, that future purpose may not even be in your lifetime. But it may be in your lifetime. It may be beyond your lifetime. But there's a future purpose behind your adversity. Now perhaps the greatest example of that is what we find in the life of Joseph. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 50. I think perhaps there's no greater earthly example of this. Uh, of course, human one, <coughs> barring the Lord's humanity, than... Uh, the patriarch, Joseph. Now, you remember what Joseph went through. Think about it for a moment. Now, we know the end, so it's easy for us to read and say, well, yeah, yeah, hold on, he had no idea. Well, yes, he had a dream, I understand that, and the bowing down, so I think he had an inkling that there was going to be a future purpose in it. But when uh, Joseph looked back on all the things that had happened in his life, I mean, his brothers sold him into slavery, uh, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Uh, not only that, but he could have been killed, but he was thrown in prison. Uh, then he helped the butcher and the baker, or the butler and the baker, and, uh, and, and uh, they forgot about him. And all of that. Notice what he says in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Uh, he's speaking to his brothers, and he says, uh, let's go to verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good uh, to bring to pass at it, as it is this day to save much people alive. Uh, Joseph foresaw that he saw that at the end of all that, that God had a plan. And may I say it again, God has a plan for your adversity and mine as well. Hey, it's not going to be forever, and there's something behind it. Uh, you know, what you're going through today may seem to be very difficult. It may, uh, again, it may seem, but tomorrow, many times, it doesn't seem as difficult as it does today. Did you get that? And it does. You ever look back on something that you've been through, and, you know, you realize it really was, wasn't quite as bad as you felt when you were going through it. And that's the way it is with many trials. You know, there's many things that I experienced when uh, my wife and I entered into the pastorate at first, I thought were the end of the world. I mean, I remember some of the things that I had, that I had experienced and uh, uh, some of the things church members did and said. I never experienced anything like that before in my life. I thought, wow, uh, and some of the troubles that, uh, uh, that I only read about people dealing with and uh, I had to deal with uh, there, I mean, family issues and so forth. I remember calling up one seasoned pastor one time, almost in a, in a frantic call, and I was like, I told him the situation, what do I do, what do I do? And, and his very simple answer was, weather the storm. I want to say, thanks a lot. <laughs> weather the storm, give me something else. I need something a little more substance here. But that's what I had to do. I had to weather the storm. But you know, when I look back on those things today, they really don't seem as difficult as they did at that time. They don't. And, uh, and I see that what God was doing was he was actually preparing me. Preparing me for what? For bigger stuff. That's what it is. Bigger stuff. And then you get 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 to the point where, you know, it's like, whatever, you know. <laughs> oh, well. Another church member murdered another church member. Oh, well. <laughs> Here we go again, amen. I'm just kidding. But it's all preparation. You, you see, understand, God wants to use all of us in a greater way than he's using you today. And so what does he do? He's going to put you through uh, the ringer, if you will. Uh, again, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Foresee the future. See what he's doing. Say, he's going to give me a challenge that I'm going to think way above my head, that when I trust him through it, he's going to strengthen me to be a stronger preacher, to be a stronger husband, to be a stronger father and grandfather. That's what he's doing. And that's what he's doing in your life.
as well. He's preparing us for what? Bigger responsibility in the future. You see, if we're not foreseeing the future, <coughs> do you know what we do? And I, yeah, here it is in, in your blanks here. If we're not foreseeing the future, then when that trial or adversity comes into our lives, then what we're going to do, we're going to do whatever we can do to do this, to stop the trial, to end the pain, to ease the suffering, and to relieve the pressure as quickly as possible. I'll say them again. If we are not foreseeing the future, then our primary goal when a trial occurs will be to do whatever we can do to stop the trial, to end the pain, to ease the suffering, to relieve the pressure again as quickly as possible. But understand, if we do that, we are going to miss out on what God is trying to accomplish, not only in our life, but also in our ministries and in the lives of others as well. But if we are foreseeing the future, then when adversity comes, even in the midst of it, we'll be able to have joy. We'll be able to have that calm peace. Then we'll endure that. We may even smile through it. We may even be able to come into church when we're bearing the weight of a very difficult situation and still come in and open up that hymn book and sing out, even in the 830 service, amen, victory in Jesus, and smile while we do it. Because we know God's working. and God's doing something in our lives. We maybe even laugh about it a little bit. Time to do that. <clears throat> Why? Because we know that God is preparing us for even a greater, greater purpose in life. You see, to have joy in adversity, we have to, again, see, live with eyes of faith, and also see the afterward, foresee the future. But then there's a third thing, and we're done right here. Not only to have joy in adversity, do we have to see with eyes of faith, and then also, secondly, to foresee the future. Lastly, back to <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12, we also have to foresee the fruit. Notice what he says in verse 11. Let's follow it here. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous, grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth, here it is, the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Do you know what the fruit that God is trying to produce in your life and my life through adversity is? It's right there in the verse. It is the fruit of righteousness, living a holy life. In other words, Christ-likeness. You know, the goal of every believer's life ought to be Christ-likeness. You know, the goal of every church ought to be Christ-likeness. You know the problem we face today in many contemporary churches is their goal is not Christ-likeness. It's not holiness. Their goal is size. How big we can get. How many people we can get into a service. That's what, that's what many are after. That's why they're doing the things they do. That's not God's goal for your life and mine. He's going to build the church. What he wants in us is, is this peaceable fruit of righteousness. He wants us to live like Jesus Christ. Uh, and when we do, by the way, we'll live holy lives. We'll win souls. We'll have separationists. We'll have all of that stuff. And God can build his church through a pure church. It's the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You know, that's why God saved us. That's why. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what he wants, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. One last passage here. Turn to Titus chapter 2 quickly. Uh, Titus chapter 2. A few pages to the left of Hebrews. Notice verse 11. <coughs> Notice we read, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, notice, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what he wants. If you're here tonight and you don't have any interest of living a, a, a righteous life or, or the fruit of righteousness, then we need to examine our heart if that's where we're at. We need to ask ourselves, are we truly saved? Or is there some unconfessed sin in my life? Or am I so filled with the philosophies and worldliness that I don't care about living for God? That's a thing we ought to do. Examine where our heart is. But you know, notice it's, a, it's this uh, fruit of righteousness. I like the way he says it. It's called the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You know, there's a tremendous peace that you have and I can have that the world cannot give. And only is known as we obey the Lord. Uh, the Lord said in Psalm 119, 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Do you know there's a great peace from being right with God? And having a clear conscience. And being right with other people. There's a peace there that the world can't give. Do you have it? Do I have it? We ought to have a great desire for that. Understand, God produces this righteousness in us through his school of adversity. So let me ask you something tonight. Are you allowing God's school of adversity to mold and shape you? Or are you fighting it? Are you kicking and screaming? Are you, have you lost your joy? One last verse. I know I said the other one was, but I, I didn't realize I had one more. Look at James chapter 1. And we'll close with this. We started here. And we're going to end here. James chapter 1. Notice verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. <coughs> Knowing this, there it is, living by faith, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But notice verse 4. But you ought to circle that little word, let. But let patience have her perfect work. Are you letting God have his way with you? Are you let, allowing the adversity to mold and shape you in the image of Jesus Christ? You can and I can experience joy through it. You know, we sing the song, When We See Christ. And that's a wonderful song. Off time, the day seems long our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase so bravely run the race till we see Christ. Do you have his joy? Maybe tonight you need to ask God to help you to see with eyes of faith. That there's more to it than what you think. God's working to foresee the future. That God's bringing you through this to mold and shape you to for a greater purpose in life. And also foresee the fruit. He's trying to make you more like his son. You see, if we have those three things in place, then when adversity comes, we can, again, not be happy through it, but have a peace and a joy that the world cannot bring. So how are you doing tonight with your trials? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your goodness tonight.